Welcome everybody to today's information session. We're going to be discussing our April structured note. This product targets a return of 4.55%, which is paid out per quarter in US dollars until it calls or reaches maturity. The session we're going to be covering the terms and conditions of this particular investment opportunity. So we're going to stay really, really focused for newcomers to structured notes who would like to understand how and why they work and deliver the returns that they can do, as well as the protection. Just either drop a message into the chat or send an email through to us on support at cashbox.global. And then we will contact you in a range of time. Cashbox is committed to delivering outstanding protected investment opportunities and providing all the information that you need to make an informed decision. So with that, going to our usual T's and C's, we are not a financial, we are, so we are a financial <laughs> registered with the FSC Mauritius. We do not provide financial advice. We provide education, information, and access to structured investment products, um, which we design. And we encourage investors to always do their own research and due diligence before making any decisions. We are also happy to chat with advisors who see value in these opportunities for their particular clients. Past performance is always not a reliable indicator for future performance and shouldn't be used to assess the future returns or risks of any product. So before we get started today, um, I just actually wanted to mention that on the 10th of April, we had an observation for one of our notes that's already running that actually includes one of the underlyings that is in this note. The note in question was issued last year in July and during all of that turmoil, this has been its third successful observation and with all the underlyings being above the income trigger, including this coupon, all of our investors have been paid out 15.75% in nine months. So that's a pretty nice return for money invested purely for nine months. So with that, I'm sure you are now quite intrigued. And so let's get started with Andrew. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, hello, everybody. Um, my weather report from Cape Town is getting darker earlier and colder. So winter is definitely on its way. Um, that being said, let's have a look. Let, let's have a look at this product. Um, let's take. Let's start at the bottom right-hand corner for a change. As as usual, we've got a pretty short runway, as I call it, in terms of subscription. In other words, subscription means that your investment funds, your allocation, must be with your custodian bank, cleared funds, application signed, and all the rest of it done. Um, Society Generale, um, Graham will attest, he's on the call. They are quite sticky, they're French, they, they do things their way, and they don't give us much wiggle room if we come late to the part. And so I would suggest that once we've been through the, the, uh, the, the, the process tonight of the presentation, that if this does fit into your rules, uh, you know, in terms of your, your rationale, in terms of your own requirements, that to, to move sooner than later. The other side of it is that we have a fairly small allocation of inventory, of, of, of uh, capacity, probably around about six to $700,000. So it's not a huge amount that we've been allocated. It's an income note. It's a conditional income note. Um, you, many on the call today will be used to having seen Catchbox has been producing what's called unconditional notes. In other words, fixed interest uh, coupons. In other words, they, they're pretty much guaranteed. These coupons are reliant on the underlying performing to a certain level and we'll go through that. Um, <clears throat> so it's a very fuzzy coupon. I haven't seen 18.2% per annum for quite some time. So 4.5% per coupon. Uh, we need to understand what is the reason for such a high coupon. Why is the bank prepared to pay us as investors, for us to give them our money uh, on loan to repay at 4.55%? Because that's an expensive cost to the bank. So they may, uh, typically banks um, want a win-win situation in these in these issuances of their balance sheet. It's gone through their credit and their, uh, their investment process. And they're happy to underwrite it, but we need to understand why is this rate as high as it is? Because certainly for the past year, we've been used to sort of 12 and 13. So this comes with, let's put it, it's, it's, I'll be very blunt with it. It comes with, an, in, it comes with an additional risk. The underlying story, the underlying theme, it's, it's not a new one, but we feel it's a tr mega trend in, in terms of what it's called thematic trends. It's a mega trend. It's a massive trend that's that's gripping the world. Uh, electric vehicles. It's aligned to clean energy. We've just uh, talked about a, a clean energy note. 
uh, clean energy, the adoption of um, clean, um, clean energy sources, environmentally sustainable and good governance companies are, are coming to the fore. There's billions of dollars pouring into these sectors. Um, and you'll see shortly um, the two companies that have been um, highlighted. Enha it's an enhanced 50-50. Many of you on the call again, and, and, I, and I, I seriously urge those who haven't been to um, a call like this before to, to reach out to Jill or anybody in the team, quite frankly, to see how we can help you further in understanding, uh, you know, educating you in, in the, the structure of how structured note works. But a 50-50, um, that's been enhanced and we'll take you through it. There are two brand new features that the Cashbox community has not seen before in a note, and that's been presented this evening. So very excited about that. Um, very chuffed that our structures have been able to uh, put this together with, with Society General. And um, let's, let's go into it in terms of those the broad brush trucks. So if you can go to the next slide. Um, we've touched on Society General. We've touched on the fact that there are electric vehicles involved. Um, I think what uh, many people on you know, looking at that slide will probably realize the guy on the left is aligned to Tesla. And we all know Mr. Elon Musk, a homegrown South African from Pretoria for a short while in his life. The guy on the right hand side might be a little bit un unknown to, to many people. Um, it's actually quite an anglicized photograph of him. His name is um, William Lee. He's a Chinese person. He's a Chinese entrepreneur, uh, probably in his early 40s. His net worth is about, uh, it's, 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 it's dwarfed by Elon's. Uh, his net worth is just under $2 billion, uh, sure. whereas Elon Musk, is, Elon Musk is probably floating. Well, Elon's come down and in, in true value as, as the world's richest man to around about $194 billion, most applied to, to Tesla and his other enterprises. But those are the two protagonists in the, in the picture and their vehicles in the background. I think what's more important, if you, if you go further into the background, you'll see the flags. Uh, of uh, the Republic of People's Republic of China on the right hand side and the United States on the left. And obviously the brand names associated alongside. Now that's quite important. I spoke about the, the fizzy frothy coupon that's being uh, delivered in this note. So clients would say to me, what is the, in, and these are the only two companies by the way, that's something else that's a little bit um, out of the ordinary. We normally have four stocks, maybe three, sometimes indices, but these are two stocks. So you've got a concentration uh, of these two companies. So we really just have to watch what these two companies get up to. Um, so let's have a look at them. I mean, Tesla's been a mainstay. It's the leader of the pack in terms of electric vehicles. Part of that mega trend that I mentioned, um, which has got a very long cycle. I mean, the adoption of clean energy, the adoption of um, environmentally well-sourced uh, companies who provide energy, is really in front and center of most conversations. You know, global warming, the men's thing, ice packs, you name it, it's in everybody's conversation. So it's a long, it's a cycle that's gonna have long legs. In other words, it's not a short duration type of um, sector that is gonna see huge spikes and then it's gonna come crashing down because the reason for that spike has disappeared. We saw that during the pandemic, we call that some of those company pandemic darlings and they're struggling to, to reassert themselves. But Tesla's been obviously going a lot longer, I think, simply by, by dint of, of, of the net wealth of those individuals. Um, but let's look, at, let's look at them in a little bit uh, different detail. I did a presentation to uh, the Australian community earlier in the week or last week. And um, I, I didn't have the luxury of being able to discuss earnings. Now, I'm, I'm very focused as an individual on quality companies delivering earnings. Um, you know, we've had high inflation, we've had high interest rates, this tightening belt of interest rate increases is with us. It's probably going to stay with us a little while longer. We'd hoped it has uh, settled down and plateau, but the recent banking crisis has probably um, left room for the various central banks to perhaps tweak up interest rates a little bit more. So that, that dampens growth stocks, and these are growth stocks. They're out and out growth stocks. Um, so once we see interest rates plateauing and probably coming off at some point, growth stocks really get going. Um, but I didn't have the, the luxury of talking to the Australian guys about earnings. And that was simply because um, it was actually towards the end of last week that both these companies had their earnings. And it's, it just shows you the size of these companies. Um, so last week, you know, I call them the EV King, Tesla, um, and the Chinese-based EV, EV upstart, if you want to call them that, Neo, had their, their Q1 
um, earnings um, for 2023. And both um, witnessed delivery growth on a yearly basis um, from their sales data that they produced. But just to give you a, an indication um, of, of, of the size, um, Tesla delivered 420, and I'm reading this because there's a lot of info here, if you just excuse me, about eye contact. The Tesla delivered 422,000 vehicles in quarter one this year, compared to 310 for the same time in 2022 and 405,000 for the last quarter of last year. Um, so that was a double beat in terms of earnings per share estimates by, by nearly 10%. It, it was really quite a stunning result. Um, Neo, and remember those are in the hundreds of thousands of vehicles. Neo delivered 10,378. So it's a very small company in terms of uh, delivery, in terms of sales, in terms of earnings at the moment compared to Tesla. But Tesla started like this as well. So did Apple, so did Amazon. And certainly in China, Neo is probably the preeminent um, uh, vehicle distributor in this electric space, in this new energy, clean energy space. Um, now, the interesting about it is that I believe the geopolitical risk is a factor that one must consider. Um, these are two companies that uh, Tesla, for example, is listed on the New York Stock Exchange. It's an American company but it has global spread in terms of its manufacturing and delivery. So it's got, it's got major factories. It's got a major gigafactory as it's called outside Beijing. And it's about to launch a battery pack company in, in the same area uh, aligned to that, that gigafactory. So, um, you know, certainly Tesla aims to build this uh, factory and it's a huge bet by Tesla by saying, you know, we really believe in China and things are going to be okay. Um, it's going to be in a huge trade-free zone, um, you know, near Shanghai, and um, clearly the geopolitical stresses that exist at a high level between the governments of, of those two countries could impact on Tesla. Um, you know, we've seen it recently. If, if people do follow the the, the financial presses, uh, a very popular Chinese company, TikTok, has been brought under scrutiny and a lot of pressure in terms of divesting Chinese ownership. Uh, from the um, from the company, the, the Americans, for example, the U.S. Senate have said there's, there's, a, there's an invasion of privacy. There's, a, there's a, perhaps a, a risk to privacy that the Chinese government might be spying through you know smart apps and smartphones and all these kind of things, and through the the app that that TikTok presents, and it's been embraced around the world. Australia, the Australian Civil Service, British Public Service, uh, parliamentarians. Uh, I, I've sort of not allowed to have it on their on their on their company phones, if you want to call it that. So there is pressure. Um, by the same token, this could be brought to bear on Neo. Neo doesn't have a, a a manufacturing presence in the United States. It's mooted to do this in 2024. They want to do that. They want to penetrate the the market there. Um, Tesla is a very big player in China as well. Um, and so there's this sort of this this, this tension between a ge at a geopolitical level that governments might get involved. You know, just before the pandemic, if you cast your mind back to 2019, uh, when Mr. Trump was in full flow in the States, uh, he wanted to make America great again. He wanted everything to be built in America, not in China, made in America, not made in China. And there was this tariff trade war. So it became a tip for tap between the governments in terms of um, imposing tariffs on uh, articles of products made in, in, in each country. So, yeah, we could see that at this level. So what I'm saying is that when one looks at this, we normally look at this, the earnings, the fundamentals of the company. What is its prices at? What is its valuations at? Has it got a great leadership team? Has it got a good product? What's the proof of the product? Um, where's its earnings? What's its dividends? You look at all the financial metrics and it makes a good story or it doesn't make a good story. Here's yeah, something different. You know, last, um, last year, 2022, we were, and we still with it, we have the shadow of the Ukrainian war in terms of supply chain disruption, et cetera. This, we have a little bit of a shadow in terms of the overarching um, geopolitical stresses between China and America. But that said, um, I'll throw a spanner into the works from a positive perspective. Um, you know, I was asked by a client of mine saying, you know, does Neo, uh, is it a Chinese owned company like TikTok? And it has Chinese government investment in it. So communism, is sometimes trumped by pragmatics of capitalism. So what I mean, I'll give you an example of this. Um, Neo turned, it, it needed to create a huge amount of, of funding 
and it turned to one of the municipal governments um, in, in eastern China. It was known as uh, Hefei, H-E-F-E-I, Hefei. I might be pronouncing it correctly. And they pledged something like uh, just short of a billion dollars, which was about five billion one, to go and help them produce uh, their infrastructure bill. They kept that investment in there. So it was a government investment in a private company. And they pulled it out a year later because they made such a good return on it. So uh, I think on the face of it, um, you know, pure communism uh, and socialism doesn't always exist. We've seen it in these type of examples. But there could be these problems with, with various governments getting involved. The Americans might start leaning on, on Neo when it arrives in the States and vice versa at a higher level between each other. So that's something that one's got. It's a bit of a left ball uh, curved field, but there's a lot of commentary about that. Um, you know, we've all seen the stresses around Taiwan, about North Korea, South Korea, Chinese seas, et cetera, and China's support of Russia and so on. So it's, it's something that was, I think one should just keep, um, you know, in, in, in one's thinking when one comes to that. Um, I think there's other, there's other uh, stresses as well. Um, I think the U.S. government last week have recently announced um, um, that some of the tax credits in terms of American cars might be given up. So there's all these different stresses. That said, electric vehicles are, are very, very popular. Um, the fossil fuel guys are, being, are certainly being phased out. Right, so um, two weeks ago, we had a webinar linked to some of the crisis and the fallout that, 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 was, that was occurred because of the financial, the financial ramifications of a couple of banks getting into serious trouble and actually going under, um, being liquidated, two in America and one in the States. And there's a whole, if you haven't seen it, I would, I would, um, I would suggest you have a look at it. It's a recording you can access. Um, it's, it's, I think it, there were some great questions asked for some clients. This is a what's called a counterparty credit monitor. You'll see there's a name of various banks there. It was alphabetical, and right at the bottom was thrown in Societe Generale because obviously we couldn't go through pages and pages of the banks. So uh, we've, we've, we've included them a lot earlier. Um, but by way of example, you'll see the two arrows pointing in there with Credit Suisse, which is one of those companies, one of those banks, European banks that uh, grabbed the, the headlights because certainly it was a global bank with global reach, a very old bank, well-known bank. And what it shows there is basically how much it's going to cost uh, to, to insure uh, against a default if you were investing with that bank. And you can see how currently, um, you know, it's very, very high. Credit Suisse, one should actually be looking now and calling it UBS because that's who basically, that's what basically happened. The government uh, arranged a very hastily marriage. They were basically told you will marry Credit Suisse, UBS, and you will take over its debt. So um, a lot of shareholders aren't very happy, but that's the way it is. So it's very, very expensive. So there's a high risk associated with it. So one would look for a much lower risk. If you look at Credit uh, um, Society General, you'll see the numbers there across the rolling period of average period, much lower in line with where one should be. When you, know, when you start getting to the 150s and 200s thereafter, it's it's somewhere that you, you're you taking on a systemic risk in that particular business. We don't look at it. And we've always said the company, the bank, the issuing bank that underwrites our products or the products that we want to get involved in or expose our clients to. Um, besides having on, let's say, for example, on the right-hand side there, the bottom right, so if you look at the credit rating agencies, S&P, Moody's, and Fitch, you know, it says A, A1, A, A stable, A, A looks great. But we all know that's not the, you know, that's not foolproof. Um, it's not infallible. We saw that in 2008. But the rules have changed. And I, I certainly believe really is going to change in the wake of what happened. Investors and depositors are not at risk. This can't happen. So this just shows you very carefully that we, uh, society in general, just to sort of um, hopefully give comfort that uh, we're very comfortable, both the, the, the structure, IDAD, as well as ourselves are comfortable with a bank like Sockchain. You know, if we were launching a note with Credit Suisse or UBS at 200, um, there's a much heightened degree of risk there. So the bank's credit committee, the bank's uh, investment committee, they've looked at this. 
they've looked at they're prepared to pay that high premium <laughs> with these two with these two companies for 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 our cash to go in them. So um, I think we can probably move on to a little bit more of of, of the companies. I've I've mentioned quite a bit about them. So let's have a look at um, one of the metrics. It's not the metric. And a lot of people get caught up on this. And I would, I would guard against saying the Wall Street side sell analysts. Boy, they're saying it's a buy. So let's all rush up and buy. Because um, I can throw up quite a few counter arguments. But it's a very strong argument when the, the bulk of the Wall Street um, brokerages have an opinion about the future concept or the future prospects of, of these particular companies. So we've isolated the two, Tesla and Neo. You can see that they're both very strong holds to buy in terms of this. And why I say you should always keep it in context is that many of those brokerages have dealings at a different level um, with those companies. And they might put that company in a very, very you know, favorable position because they might be intrinsically involved in funding a particular position for that business. So it's just one of the metrics that I use, but it's a very solid metric at the moment. And this metric can change very quickly. Um, I always say to individuals, when you look at statistics, understand the caveats that are the health warnings and the health warnings are that these, uh, these, this, this analytical data can literally change overnight. You know, something came after, after covered tomorrow, let's say in Tesla or Neo, it could change, it could change these, these percentages overnight. A bit like what happened to, to Credit Suite. So it's not infallible. I think what the, uh, the bank looks at is, is certainly this because it gets a broader spread um, of hopefully objective, but I believe there's quite a bit of subjective in there. But they look at the metrics such as um, the price earnings ratios, the valuations, the dividend cover, uh, the management structures, earnings, guidances, which are very important. They're becoming so important in terms of every quarter of the company when it puts its earnings on deck, as they call it, like Neo and, and Tesla have just done. They'll say, right, that's looking backwards. We did very well. We delivered 404,000 cars. But Elon Musk, for example, his golden, his, his, well, his holy grail at the moment, and I think it's a moving target, is 2 million cars in one year to deliver 2 million cars. So um, he's for this. How are we going to, have we done right? What have we done wrong? And the market then has a look at it, including these guys, the side sell analysts, to say, right, how realistic is that? Is it possible? I mean, Tesla did fantastically well because they cut globally. They went on a global worldwide cost-cutting exercise where they've made their costs far more um, affordable. Um, and obviously, they're hoping that volume will overcome uh, margin. But I think have a look at the, you know, that, so that's the left-hand side of the screen. The right-hand side of the screen um, is a little bit more stochastic in terms of numbers and dates. And, you know, we've all known that Tesla has been a fantastic stock for many, many people. I would rather point to the fact that in 2022, um, they came down to a more normal situation in terms of earnings and not simply uh, being driven by momentum. And certainly from, um, I took a, did I actually take a screenshot of their pricing in March, I think it was this year. And I think their low was in, in March this year. And I'm talking about this year, 2023. They plumbed down to about $110 a share. And they're currently trading at one, uh, just under 190, I think 180, I haven't looked uh, exactly. So that means I would suggest that they, they're moving more in line with delivering, um, keeping their earnings intact. And certainly that um, this certainly augurs well for the next 12 months. And it sort of aligns with the left-hand side. So it's a good entry point. We're not going in sort of at the top in 21 and 22. We're going at a much more reasonable level. Um, and that, this is important because it plays out into our, on, on the slide that we'll show next, which is generally the, um, the metrics of the actual product itself in terms of auto call. Let's have a look quickly at Neo. Neo is a very different company. As I've said, it produces um, sorry, can we just go back there? It produces far less vehicles. It's in. It only got the, the the company itself was only established in, by William Lee in 2014, so it's got a short history. But you can see its absolute exponential rise um, in line with what happened during. You know, started off from the pandemic, um, you know, tilt upwards, um, astronomical growth. What Neo looks to do is very different to Tesla has embraced it, but 
Um, Tesla is trying to develop batteries that will last, for example, on one charge a thousand miles. Neo says, well, that's great, but we're going to do a different route. Um, they're going into what's called battery swapping. So they're developing infrastructure primarily across China to start with in terms of building factories and building hubs for infrastructure in terms of you drive with your battery. When you get to a point where your battery is at 10%, you pull into the truth would be a service station today. You swap out your battery. It's like you know, when your gas bottle ends, you drive down to the, the local service station, you swap out, you get a full bo a bottle of gas and you go home and connect it. So that's what they're doing. So literally you'll be piggybacking across, across China, swapping your battery out. So they're building um, these battery swap facilities um, pretty much right the way through um, um, throughout China. Um, they're looking at each hub will be able to be 480 to 490 swaps a day. So that's a lot of batteries uh, you're talking about. Um, and obviously they, they would probably see that strategy rolling out into, into other areas of the world. So there's probably gonna be complementary opportunities and strategies, you know, Tesla's long range batteries, you know, the sort of golden chalices, how can we get these, these, uh, these batteries to produce on one charge a trip of, you know, a thousand, a thousand miles. And then you're gonna have a, a, a sort of another ecosystem of a fabric of battery swapping um, opportunities if, if you're that way inclined. So certainly these are two, probably the most prominent companies. I mean, the EV market, the electric vehicle market is absolutely swamped by newcomers that have started up with brand new names that nobody's ever heard about. Um, and then you've obviously got your legacy car makers who are moving very strongly into, into the space because they've absolutely threatened governments have said, you know, uh, no more fossil fuel burning cars by 2030 or 2035, only hybrids and then it's clean energy only. So your GMs, your Volkswagen, Mercedes, your supercars even, uh, everybody is switching over at a point in time. So um, it's going to be interesting seeing maybe the Formula One world, if, if that actually does make a huge transition, complete transition to electric vehicles. Um, I think we're all very you know, used to seeing Max Verstappen and, um, and Hamilton racing around in, in noisy cars. It's going to be quite interesting. But it's a, it's a trend and it's an opportunity where these companies um, are front and center in terms of their respective markets. I'd just like to comment before we move on to the metrics. The slide down in value of NEO, because I was asked this question by, by a trustee um, yesterday. They said, what, what has occasioned that? Has something gone wrong? They've been delivering market, uh, cars to market, but at a lower level to what obviously Tesla's doing. What NEO has been doing, their earnings have been crushed. And I keep going back to companies with superior quality earnings. Their earnings have been crushed because the money that they are making, they're basically re-employing back into the business. There's no dividend payouts to investments, it's simply, this is a growth stock. It's an out and out growth stock. But this battery swapping, for example, infrastructure ecosystem that they're building, that costs money. And they're either funded by an external, somebody taking an external stake like the Chinese government did, or they actually put their earnings back into their, their own business. Um, I've always said to clients, your best, in, your, best in business, your best investment is in your own business if it's a good business. Because uh, you know exactly how that works. You know exactly the pitfalls and the bear traps out there. So certainly, um, Neo at the moment, in terms of its pricing levels, good entry pricing levels, it's below $10. Um, there's a lot of, because of this mega trend, they caught up in it. Um, and I think, again, to, to give some solace to my, my rather gloomy, geopolitical picture. I think China and America uh, want to own that space um, in terms of, you know, whether it be an American company or a Chinese company, but Neo certainly is head and shoulders above all its, all its Chinese peers. So yeah, it's, um, it's, a, it's I think it's, it's a lovely story. It's a great story. And let's go to the metrics in terms of, let's see what risks we, we need to mitigate. Um, if we can go to the next, next slide, please. Okay, so we're not going to dwell on Societe General issuing. We just work from top to bottom. They're the issuing bank, good ratings, and we've seen their, um, their, their costs. Um, it's a memory income auto call. In other words, what this means is that um, it pays 4.55% per quarter on the auto call. Okay. Um, I beg your pardon, on the 50% on the of an initial level. So this pays out events. Okay. 
Um, there's a, a term sheet, there's a fact sheet that actually details each of those dates. Um, it's a maximum of four years, but it could end earlier. And that is the order call trigger halfway down. Um, and here's one of our first features that I think is really interesting. We start, we, we, we've got the order call of 95% of initial value. So those two companies will be valued on a specific date, okay? And um, it'll be set at 95% of that start price. So if those companies uh, rise above that level, ordinarily it triggers. Now, this is where it's slightly different. It's called a knockout feature, okay? Starts, first observation is the 12 months for this knockout feature. So what happens with, let's say in 12 months, at the first observation, let's say uh, Tesla is above 95% of its initial value. And Neo is, let's say, at 80% for whatever reason. One is above and one is below. What that actually means is that Tesla gets, a, if you want to call it a tick in, tick in the box, we don't really have to worry about it for the order call again. It's done what it's supposed to do. We just now got to wait for Neo to rise above that level. And the first time that Neo does that, the whole investment will then trigger. Normally, what happens is that both, if we don't have this knockout feature, both have to be above the 95% at that specific time. So what we're saying is they can rise at different levels um, at different times. And we will capture that. If they're successful, we'll capture it in the bank, if you want to call it, for the order call. So that's slightly different. Um, it gives us, I think, the opportunity if I can that one to pick up. All the while, you're picking up this 4.55% as long as those companies don't fall below 50%. And I think Chad's got a great slide. Um, the slide master will take you through that uh, after this slide. So that's the first new feature that we haven't had before. It gives more flexibility, I believe, in capturing the opportunity to actually order a call. And the bank likes that because it doesn't want to pay this 4.55%. 4.55%, you know, forever. It's got to pay for certainly for a year, but they might also like to get out of this early. Um, we've mentioned the the reference basket. There is a full rationale that you can go and have a look at. It's got much more detail in. Um, capital protection. Here's the second new feature. Okay. Um, normally we have a 50%. We've still got 50%. In other words, as long as the capital values of Tesla and, and Neo haven't more than half. So they haven't more, they haven't degraded by more than 50%, you'll get your cash back. Okay. Now, what a 50% get put at maturity means is that it's, it's I suppose it's the worst case scenario. The question often gets asked, okay, cash box, what happens if one of those companies has actually gone below 50%? Okay, it's been great. I've picked up my my 4.55% for four years and on. And at the end of the day, um, at the very last observation, Tesla crashes and burns and goes to you know below 50. What's going to happen? So I'll let Chad take you through that, give you a little bit of suspense here. But basically what we do is we mitigate any loss. Well, we mitigate the loss that would otherwise be occasioned. Okay? So normally you do lose money. Well, in this case, there'll be money lost, but not as much. And we'll explain how we do that. Okay. I started off by the wrong way around by saying 24th of April's are, are, are doomsday, or D-Day, to get your money in, and all the full uh, subscription. Um, you know, if that does go, we could have one client say, look, I'm going to take 500,000. It's a bit rude. We'd love that. But uh, I think, uh, you know, obviously, then it puts huge pressure on everybody else who is interested. Uh, minimum investment, um, as per our usual, um, $10,000. $10, so just to recap, um, that I'd like Chad, and he's going to take you through that because most of you will have seen these slides before. The auto call trigger with a knockout feature and the doomsday scenario, what happens if it did go below 50? How do we how do we hop out? So, Mr. Pope, it's, I'm passing the baton. Nice. Andrew, always great to listen to you and hello, everybody. Good to chat again. Um, what Jill's done nicely in this graph is drawn two wavy lines. And that could represent either of the shares. And the idea here is to chat around what could potentially happen and what would happen in different scenarios. So as we know, we always look at the uh, product in quarters. And should we be successful in each quarter, we'll be receiving 4.55% paid to our trading platform. So let's follow the darker line for now. Let's say, let's say this is near. 
NEO rises in value in quarter one. And can you see we are above the income trigger of 50%? We're well above. So we're in the money. Our coupon pays. Each coupon is going to continue paying until we reach the auto call level, which is the dotted line. And that dotted line starts at quarter four and would run for the balance of the product. It's set at 95%. So NEO could even drop by 5% and will be at the auto call level. Let's say at any time from quarter four onwards, NEO is above, um, perhaps in the fifth quarter, where that little X is, bang, we're going to auto call. And this is that knockout feature we're chatting about. Tick in the box, NEO is auto called. We don't have to worry about it. Uh, that's that share again. Now we follow the red line. Let's say this is Tesla in this case. Similar scenario, it rises, it falls. We don't mind. As long as it's above 50%, we're going to keep getting all our coupons. You'll remember the memory feature in the middle at the bottom. Should any one of these shares be below 50% on the specific day of observation, we might not then get, sorry, we will not then get our uh, coupon paid out. But not to worry, that's not lost. As soon as the shares back over 50%, at the next observation, we'll get that next observation plus anything that's missing gets paid back out. What a wonderful feature. And this is why pension funds um, and the likes love these products because we now get a certainty of, of uh, flow uh, through the course of the year. Perhaps it is that uh, Tesla then goes through that order call and a little later, that's fine. Again, we're going to close out. We will get the last coupon paid out and our full capital back. Now, as a very, this is exactly as the product's designed, right? And this is what the bank wants, and this is what we as investors want. We want that order call before full maturity. Let's say the product runs to full maturity, and let's say we follow, let's say the 80% line. So one share in this basket runs below order call. It gets to the, the last quarter, and perhaps it's 20% below. The great news is we built in capital protection. So as long as all, sorry, both shares are above 50, at or above 50% of its start price, in other words, they've halved in value, we'll get our full capital out. Now along comes this amazing feature. I think it might be the next slide. There we go. What this product has in it, and first time we've seen this in, in one of our products is a put function. And what this does is it builds in an extra level of insurance. And what that put says is if, for example, one of those shares was at uh, just below 50%, in all our other notes so far, we would get out of our capital, whatever the lowest share was worth at that point in time. So let's say one of those shares, and it has not happened yet, Let's say one of those shares closed at 40% of its start price. Traditionally, we get 40% out. The put function is brilliant. It halves that loss again. So if it closed at 40% of its start price, we'll actually get 80% of our capital out. And so it follows all the way down. Instead of one for one, it's a half for one, if that makes sense. So even if the, the worst performing share was at 30%, we'd get 60% of our capital out with this extra level of protection built in. A wonderful feature uh, that's put into this to help us risk mitigate again, uh, given the, the shares that are in this particular basket. So Andrew and Graham, really well done. So where in the world you get products that are built with all these different layers of protection, you would obviously want to do your own DD, your own risk management and say, like, is, is this uh, for you? Does this fit your portfolio? And where does this take you? So again, just to summarize, banks got to be very comfortable with the options that they're going to create. They're going to borrow our money. They're going to be comfortable. They're going to pay it back. They've done a lot of due diligence. They reckon this is good to go. They're going to make a healthy profit once the product auto calls, and so will we. Uh, we've got to be comfortable with the strength of the bank. So you've seen the analysis we're doing on the banks. We're comfortable with SockGen. Amazing. And in the underlying stocks, in this case, uh, we've got to be comfortable that they're not likely to more than halve in value. And even if they do, we've got these different levels of protection that have been built in uh, in this case. So great amount of protection built in. Andrew, thanks for that. And the last slide, um, for those that are brand new to structured notes, um, 
As Jill mentioned, we'd love to spend more time with you and explain this in detail. But as you know, we would need a trading platform to do this with. Trading platforms are brilliant. Your cash is under your control. Um, they're going to hold the securities on your behalf. Next one, Jill. Thank you. And then um, if you are interested, reach out. We'll let you know. We'll give you the ISIN number. That ISIN number is what you would use then to go into the product. And then on the reporting, we continue sending our quarterly observations and updates. That's a lovely way to set. And we'll keep reminding you as this happens. Again, the closing date for subscriptions is the 24th of April. Thanks, Jill. Cool. Is that it? Just the little last page. Quick summary. You go for it. You go for it. <laughs> so basically, just a quick summary. Uh, just to let you know, Eric, we're going to come back to your question now. Um, quick summary, we are looking at a quarterly coupon of 4.55% in US dollars that are obviously paid every successful quarter and an annual return of 18.2%. Your maximum term in the event that it doesn't auto call is four years. Um, it'll continue to auto call all maturity. Your full capital will be returned on auto call. And as long as your worth performer is above 50% of its start price, you will get your full capital back, if it does dip below the 50% mark, they're actually going to double up your return. So instead of getting it from a one-to-one -one basis, you're going to get it doubled up. And then, um, okay, so I've done that. And then obviously our minimum investment is from $10,000 upwards. What I'm going to do is just in, in closing, we're going to, uh, we need to answer any questions that we have. Um, Eric does have a great question. And before I get to Eric's question, just to let you know, if you are interested in participating, just pop us an email um, in case I don't have everybody's email address because I see we have had quite a few people that have hopped on that didn't go via the regular RSVP channel. So I don't have to email at all the email addresses. If you'll just drop a mail into um, support at cashbox.global, I will put that in the chat. Um, but for now, if we can just do questions and then starting with Eric's question, what is the original the, the additional risk that Andrew was referring to? Andrew, do you want to talk about that, the geopolitical side? That may have been the risk coverage. Um, so that, I know it's, it's the geopolitical uh, oh, hi, Eric. Are they? How are you doing? Uh, I think it's really the to the specter of governments um, kind of getting involved, intervening, and it's you know at, at, a, at a macro level, and obviously um, you know if they have geopolitical strategies, it will come down to a commercial level where they say you may not have a business in China, or you may not have products from China, or you may not have products from America. So um, you know certainly uh, you know if, you, if one looks at the American strategy, and I'll give you an example of this: of any conductors. Uh, China, the products for semiconductors, microprocessors, which are used in pretty much everything these days. And the American government under the CHIPS Act, um, it started under Trump, um, and all, uh, finished off during Biden's time, is that the Americans have been told, you guys need to become self-sufficient in creating your own semiconductors. So it's, it, creates, it creates stress and strain within in that particular sector. So what I'm saying, trade war, it could impact on the earnings of uh, those companies. So let's say the trade war ignites between America and China, and Chinese government said to Tesla, well, you can't produce any more cars in China. It's going to be a major dent on their earnings stream because a big component of their earnings streams comes out of China. Vice versa, the same apply for, for, for the Americans leaning on Neo if they allow them into that space. So it's really at a macro level. It may not happen. But it could happen. Um, that you know, we've seen this. We've seen this in the past. Now, this is the world's biggest economy uh, going up against the you know the pretender, the second biggest economy in the world. Um, and the, certainly, the Chinese don't want their economy to to fail. They can't let their people. You know, their their markets have come off dramatically. Their stock markets have devalued incredibly. Um, and that's why I say I think there is a pragmatism in how they deal 
with communism and, and capitalism. Uh, there is some pragmatism. So it's probably a worst case scenario, Eric, but I think it's something that one, you know, it's, it's in conversation. I have these conversations regularly about the stresses of, of, of um, politics and coming down to a business level with, can, that can affect, a, can affect a, a company in a particular environment. Right, then um, from Greg says, um, I see this notice only offered in USD. Are there any concerns <coughs> of dethroning the USD and its possible devaluing? Can I can I throw can I throw a a man on the on the island Isle of Man on, under the under the water? Yeah, it's been far too quiet. Absolutely, yeah, no, delighted. Um, that's that's a great a great question, and um, you know, quite quite frankly, it's uh, it, it's it's such a, a a subject that you've got to go into in such massive detail, which would take a long time. But I'll try and do it as quickly as possible, and I th I think ultimately. What we're looking at here is trying to dethrone a currency which has been the reserve of the planet um, since 1944. So, you know, the end of the end of the Second World War, the Americans took the initiative and um, and they've moved forward ever since. And they're obviously as a as a as a nation, they have progressed, they've uh, they've grown, they've become the um, you know the wealthiest nation on the on the planet. And um, and the dollar has embedded itself across the globe. Now, I think ultimately to answer the question is to say, well, OK, the dethroning of the dollar, who what's going to replace it? And at the moment, I think there are various parties that are considering. The most obvious one, of course, I think is a is a is a BRICS conglomerate. Um, but I think the stability of that particular um aspect is such that it um it, it it defies gravity it's just i just don't see it being possible um i think china would have to move ahead on its own um quite frankly and and that would be extremely difficult to try and then challenge the dollar uh, as a proposition um there's a whole host of geopolitical demographic um, uh, you know, resource-driven perspectives to what can support how this is going to develop. But ultimately, I think it will take a huge amount of time. And being rather cheeky, um, this is a four-year term note. And I think within four years, the dollar is not going to be dethroned. So I think we're okay, <laughs> is my answer. <laughs> I don't know whether you can add to that, Andrew. Yeah, I mean, obviously, the big area, Craig, is um, digital assets. Um, you know, even the American government is talking about a U.S. Fed coin. Um, so, in line with the bitcoins, the ether coins, the ripples, you know, the whole crypto space um, is a little bit under pressure as well, quite frankly. Um, certainly, the valuations and the, the 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 buying power, the parity of the dollar has has seen a decline um, against major trading uh, partners. Um, but certainly, you know, the, the drama that we had in banks three weeks ago, um, two months ago, we had it in the crypto space, which quite frankly also needs guardrails put on. Um, you know, there were some spectacular crashes, probably the biggest one being the FCX debacle, um, which has cost a lot of people a lot of money. Um, banks have got more regulations, but they weren't playing in, in the right spaces and the right rules. That's why I think regulation, I think regulation is a good thing. You can overregulate something out of out of out of business, and you can kill great ideas. I think there will be regulation, and there's obviously an arm wrestle globally as to who is the biggest economy, who's the most powerful economy, who's got the most powerful um, trading trade balance or the most powerful uh, currency. It's it's not an ego thing. It it boils down to who's pretty much not running the world, but who's got a big say in the world. Mm. So I I tend to agree with Graham in terms of the, the systemic involvement in dollars from a pricing perspective and from a value perspective as is backed by the US is probably going to be with us in the next four years. I think we're going to see a huge evolution. And I, I'm, I'm late to the party in digital assets, but I believe there's a space for them. And I believe they're an important player. I do, however, believe that the regulation needs to come in to, to let them evolve correctly and not to have these spectacular crashes. So yeah, I think um, it's still a very, very popular currency as a fiat currency, if you want to call it that. 
um, and I think it's very much um, pretty much part of the part of the horizon for certainly four years yeah but a, but a good question yeah right so we got a question from Manesh please explain what value of original capital is returned if each product say rises 40 percent from the base final date yeah so I'll, I'll jump in there quickly and I'm sure Andrew will add if I miss anything out but uh, but essentially the the, the note is cool. has its parameters is going to deliver 18.2 percent per annum on a quarterly basis thereof um, if those parameters are met so in answer to Manesh's question the if there is growth in the in the basket of notes and those two being Tesla and Neo um, that growth is irrelevant um, to this in the sense of the return to the investor. The return to the investor is income and it is specified in the note per the contractual agreement. Um, and the and any growth in Tesla or Neo is irrelevant to the investor. And so therefore, for example, if Tesla and Neo doubled in the in the four year term and the note went for for its full term, um, then the investor would still receive 18.2% per annum if that income trigger had been met um, each year for the four-year term. Um, so the, the, the performance of the underlying basket, the two notes, is only relevant where there is depreciation of, the, of that individual share. So where there is a, where there is a, um, a, a loss um, and it breaches the parameters defined in the in the contractual note, which um, Chad has explained. Then there may be impact, but any growth is is only relevant um, for the auto call, um, and that is it. Andrew, I'm I'm sure you you might have Maybe something I to add. add. Maybe I could add. So Manesh, we are really giving up the upside for all this downside protection. No. Yeah. So basically your capital would still remain at 100% because you would have received the income. Put it this way, if it runs to the, the full term and it auto calls, you will have received all the coupons up until that date. Okay, um, Eric, um, Anish, does that answer your question? Cool, okay. Maybe, then, maybe. Sorry? <clears throat> No, sorry, I was going to, uh, yeah, sorry, carry on, carry on, Jill. Okay, so then we've got another question from Eric. It says, if any, if if one underlying company will auto call and the other not yet, will the company who auto called continue to pay the quarterly interest still mature, till maturity? Um, okay, so I'm going to try and pick through that question. Um, it's, uh, I mean, it, essentially, the what what we've got here is a ninety five percent auto call level uh, with a knockout. Now, as has exp as as has been explained, um, if one of those two shares hits ninety five percent, then it's knocked out, and then we await for the other share to achieve that level. Um, we're not that each individual share in its own right is not specifically. Def uh, defining the return income it's actually the, the 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 level of the income trigger for both shares to achieve so that income trigger is 50 percent and so therefore both of those shares have to achieve um a a 50 percent or over to be able to provide that income trigger the way to look at a note is to always look at the worst performing share in the basket and because there's only two then it's one or the other and that will decide on what parameters are breached or achieved, et cetera, et cetera. So always look at the worst performing share to decide on what activity is going to occur, occur within the note. So Eric, it will continue paying each quarter as, as yeah. defined. Yeah. Great, are there any other, are there any other questions? not great well i think that's it so thank you everybody for joining us this evening
We will be sending out a mail in the morning just so that you can, if you do want to know more details or even if you want to set up another call to chat through it again, we're here to answer any of your questions. And with that, thanks, Andrew. Thanks, Chad. Thanks, Graham. And thanks, for everybody, for joining us. Thanks, everybody. Good to see Good everybody. To chat. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers Bye. now. Cheers. Bye-bye. 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 Have a good evening. Yeah, Bye. Bye.